Father, we thank you this afternoon already. You are the one that has brought us together. You've brought us together to speak to us, to minister to us. You've brought us together again, even for your word said you are faithful, you who have called us even into the fellowship of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the fellowship of your son, Jesus, which you have called us to Come and partake of. We want to thank you. We thank you, Lord, for you will grant us even the deeper understanding entrance much more into the things of the Spirit, even into the things of divine nature, to the things that makes your nature. Lord, the things that makes for your glory. We are asking for greater entrance in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I, I come before you, humbling my heart before you, for I know I can do nothing of myself. I am under you, Lord Jesus. I ask that you will help me, that I will speak even as I ought to. Lord, help my mouth, help my heart, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. You're welcome again in Jesus' name. My Bible to the book of uh, Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3. We'll just begin from there. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ, who was faithful to him that appointed him. That word appointed him also means made him. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses in as much as he that had builded the house had more honor than the house. For every man, for every house is builded by some man, but he that builded all things is God. Now, but, uh, you know, the word there is in italics, that is the things, is. Things and is, is in italics, means it can also be, you know, um, it, it, it was added. Sometimes the manuscript might not be so clear, and then the people who are translating it in order to give it um, a kind of, sometimes they, are, they add just one or two uh, words to give it a, an understanding or a flow. Praise God. You must understand that. And then uh, uh, at times also, when, when they might not be there, in order to follow a particular line of flow, they also add. Amen. But here, if we remove that, it means it's um, what we call that in, 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 in Bible uh, survey or, uh, or Bible exegesis, uh, according to theological whatever, we call that part that has italics a parenthesis. Amen. Praise God. I'm not going to bore you with Bible theology or whatever, but I'm just want to, I want to show you something. Uh, you need, sometimes you need to get this so that you can see clearly. Amen. Now, I love that he said, uh, so you can, read, you can read like this. For every house is builded by some, by some man, but he that builded or that built all God. He that built all God. He that built all God. Now, that he that built all 
two things you can take away from there is that he that built all is God. But you can also take that he that built, because here he's comparing building, he was comparing Moses and then the comparing Christ with Moses. Now one of the things that was spoken about Moses was that he was faithful in the house. But now we're talking about Jesus as a son in the house. Now these are two buildings that God built. Now the house that Moses was, was built, he was built to be a servant. That Moses was built to be a servant, but here they are talking about Jesus. He wasn't just built to be a servant, he was built to be a son. A son, meaning that his kind of house is the prototype of the building that God is building in this end time. Hallelujah. The building is Christ. The building is Christ. So God is the one who has ability to build Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Has ability to do what? To build Christ. Now it's God that builds Christ. Just follow me. It's God that has what it takes to build Christ. It was God who raised Jesus Christ. Now, where we read, he said he was faithful. Let's look at it again. Verse 2. Who was faithful to him that made him. I use the word made him because... That is also the, when you check the footnotes, you, what you see there is made. Huh? That word appointed him can also be called made him. Amen. So you can say it was God who built him. Now, God building him, there was a kind of faithfulness that was required of him when he was being built. There's a kind of faithfulness that was required. Yeah, Moses was faithful in, in, in all his house. Meaning, while Moses was also being built, there was a kind of faithfulness that Moses also had. Or Moses, in responding to the building that God was building, there was a kind of faithfulness that was demanded of Moses. The same way also, in responding, there was a kind of faithfulness that Christ had. You know, when you read the book of Revelation, you hear his name is faithful and true. Faithful and true. Amen. Are you following me? Faithful and true. That was his name. Now that name is not just talking about what it's called. It's talking about the nature of his nature, meaning he was made faithful to truth. He was faithful to truth. Truth which was God. Meaning God built him to be a man that will be faithful. Who was faithful to him that made him. As also Moses was faithful in all his house. So Moses, while Moses was being built, Moses was faithful. But Jesus, because of the kind of house he is, he is being raised, which is a house that is very, very important to us, the reason is because that is a kind of house that God wants to build or raise again. God wants to raise you and me as a house. So God raised Christ. It was God who raised Christ. How? He made him. Why did he make him? 
Now, verse 1, let's go to verse 1. We'll start from there. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the what? Heavenly calling. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of what? The heavenly calling. I love that. They, he didn't say partakers of a heavenly calling. He said they, heavenly calling, meaning specifically pointing to a kind of calling. Partakers of the heavenly calling. First of all, let's begin with the fact that he called them holy brethren. Holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Holy brethren. Now for you to be called holy brethren, you must be in the holy place. You must be in the holy place. For you to be called holy brethren, it's good enough we call brethren. But when I say holy brethren, it signifies or shows that you've passed a process of being purified, a process of being made holy, or a process that has brought you to the holy place. In other words, you are not actually, you know, we, we can quote that and, 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 you know, quote that and claim it for ourselves, but really when you look at it, you, you, you see that to be holy brethren is, is weighty. Is weighty. Is weighty. Like I said, you can be called brethren, but to say holy brethren, holy brethren, is rather saying that this one has experienced a level of separation. Hallelujah. Has experienced a level of separation, which separation is done by faith. Which is the activities that you find in the holy place, meaning they have ministered properties of the holy place to such a soul, for such a soul to be called holy, bre holy brethren. Another word you also find is in the book of Revelation. He's, I mean, also in the person who is holy apostles and prophets. Have you seen it? He called his holy apostles and prophets. When he was talking about Christ being, you know, laid. Huh? He mentioned on the foundation of the apostles. Now, these apostles and prophets, we are holy. Now, another place in Peter, I said, for holy men of God. Are you getting that? So, you can see it's a weighty thing. It's not just light. It's not just something we can claim. He said, for holy men of God prophesied. As they were moved by the Spirit. Now, meaning, what I'm trying to show you, that's Holy is signifying that they have experienced some level of separation for them to be called holy men. Now, for here, where we are looking at in Hebrews chapter 3, when he said, holy brethren, holy brethren, now, meaning that these ones, now, you know, he was talking to the Hebrew church. Now, if you've listened to Reverend, there, there was a time he took time to teach, dwell a whole, whole long time for, I mean, with us in the book of Hebrews, you know. Um, if you listen to those messages, you'll be able to, you know, uh, touch what I'm saying this afternoon. Now, the, the Hebrew church, from our understanding, happens to be a church. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a, a canal church. It wasn't a carnal church because when he was talking to them, he was saying we ought to leave the elementary principles of the doctrines of Christ. Now, the elementary principles of the doctrines of Christ, which he mentioned in chapter 6, and then we should go on to perfection. Then he began to talk to them about meat. That's in chapter 5. Strong meat, not even meat, strong meat. In Corinthians, he talked about meat. But when he was talking to the Hebrews, he was telling them about strong meat. Belonged to them that are what? Are what? Of age. Those who are of age. Now that of age is Christ. 
That of age is a separation of the holy place. I don't know if you're following me. So the strong meat belongs to, you can put it this way, strong meat belongs to Christ. Strong meat belongs to Christ. It's Christ that strong meat belongs to, really. Strong meat belongs to them that are, so you can see that the church in Hebrew, the church of Hebrew, you know, now when you look at them generally and read the epistles that was written to them, you can deduce some things. Because by 12, in chapter 12, sorry, in chapter 12, not by 12, in chapter 12, he said to them, he says that we are compassed with so great cloud of witnesses. Now, do you know what it means to be a witness? You know what it means to be a witness? To be compassed with great cloud of witnesses is declaring where you're standing. Now, it's not everybody that is compassed with great cloud of witnesses. Because these witnesses have their stand. They have their, I will call it, they have their grandstand. They have a place where they stand. And then for you to be compassed about with such witnesses means that you have, or you've been, you are either you are about to be admitted to that stand or that you are also given right of way to stand there for them to compass you. Now it's not everybody, it's not every child of God that they compass. Amen. Amen. Well, when we say this is, uh, please don't, mis don't misunderstand us. I just, we, just want to, we just want you to see something. So he was telling them, saying that you are compassed, look at it. We are for seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, first of all, to be compassed. Now, this is not white cloud. These are dignitaries in the spirit. Are you with me? What did I call them? Dignitaries in the spirit. Now, these dignitaries in the spirit are called witnesses. Cloud of witnesses. They are cloud of witnesses. Now, when you hear the cloud, meaning they have come into allocations in the spirit. They have come into allocations in the spirit that they are called cloud. You know, in the book of Jude, he mentions some people as cloud without water. So you can see that cloud are men. Are you following me? That clouds are what? Men. In the book of Jude, he called some, some. Now those ones he called clouds, we are not children. They were not, this we are, I will call them this we are, somewhat matured. Meaning they've come into some kind of stature. They we are teachers. First of all, they were apostles. And some of them we are prophets. And then if you're a, a past, I mean apostle or a prophet, one thing is either you're a preacher or you're a teacher. So you are teachers. That is one thing. All the fivefold ministry have one, I mean, two things they do. Is it that they preach or they teach? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. What did I say? All the fivefold ministry, is it that they preach or they teach? They do nothing else but do what? Preach or teach. They don't go into politics. Because you're going to be hearing some very, very funny things as election is coming up. We are just talking about some of them in the car while we are coming. I'm going to be hearing some people said, I am an apostle too. Apostle in the political sector. Apostle in the political landscape. They don't need apostles there. So without understanding, I was telling them in the car while we are, I was just you know, trying to open the eyes. I said, one of the things about apostolic spirit, pastor, is that it has a governmental, you know that governmental thing that makes you, you can be seeing things, you, you can set for things in order. 
set forth structures. So that governmental spirit is an anointing. Is an anointing. Yesterday night, I remember I was meditating. The Lord told me, you must know how to. It was the issue of my body. I just want to make reference to you so that you can understand what I'm saying, anointing. It was the issue of my body. The Lord was telling me, he said, you must be able to differentiate between the Holy Ghost and the anointing. He told me, he said, the Holy Ghost is not the anointing. You must know the Holy Ghost is a person. He's not just the anointing. So you can't say the anointing is upon me. That's why I must, I must do this. No. Check with the person. The anointing is his influence on you. And his influence can be on you even after he has gone. So he may have gone and you're, the, the influence is on you and you can continue doing what you're doing thinking that he's there. He's not there. But after a while, the anointing will begin to wane and wane. And by the time he wanes, you will be found naked. Because the one who clothes you is no more there. So, so you can understand what I'm talking about, the apostolic spirit. That apostolic spirit has... Is governmental in nature. Most, most men who, most ministers who have apostolic calling. The problem, the temptation all the time is the issue of government. The thing because of, you know there's a way the thing shows. There's a way it shows. And when it begins to show, you think it is for the world to be expressed in the world. No, it's for the church. And then if you're also not careful, you can begin to set structures in the church that is not of God, that is of the world. It's just that. Now, I remember men like Alexander Darwin. That was, a pro, that was not just a... He was an apostle. There are many, many of them, I can tell you, that we are apostles, except the Lord helps your heart. And then imprisons you. That anointing can, you know, you just see, you'll be seeing what can be done in Nigeria, what can be done in Lagos, what can be done, and everything will work. Yeah. And then ideas will just, and before you know what is happening, you feel called to go and do that. No, it's a temptation because apostle, listen to me, apostle, fivefold, fivefold, can you say fivefold ministry? Fivefold, can you say fivefold ministry? I'll just go this way a little bit and come out. For can you say fivefold ministry? Five Who are they? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. What are they? What is their job? Huh? So their job is preaching and teaching. Their job is not politics. Their job is not to make policy for the nation. Their job is is they are not called to change. Are you understanding me? Change the lives. You know, you, you know, and that's what I mean by changing the lives. We need to begin to feed the poor. We need to begin to do this one. You no, know, we need to put structures so that, you know, the roads can be built and things will be working well. That is not your business. Your business is to preach and teach because by t preaching and teaching, you equip the saints. Your job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then some don't even understand what the work of the ministry is. Some think that the work of the ministry is that we'll equip the saints by giving them all kinds of knowledge for them to go and begin to impact their society. I don't know that craze, that madness to impact their society. And I said, I said something, I said, Jesus, to many of us, would have been a failure. You know, because while he was here, he concentrated on one thing. He concentrated on one thing. He wanted to deal with Satan. He has to deal with the law of sin and death. That was all. So the healing the sick, the raising the dead, the, all the multiplication, that was not the job. That was not the main job. That he did while he was here. But, you know, 
If you don't understand what the weeping the saints is, you will think that, okay, the reason why God gathered them or gathered us is so that we can, somebody puts it this way, we don't have branches, we have expressions. You know, I told somebody, I said, I, I, love, I love my daddy, I love Reverend. He will tell you, leave things the way they are. You're not Jesus. It was like that before you came. And don't think you are sent to come and change the season and the time and the order. Preach and go. The Holy Ghost is the one who does things in the church. Now men trouble themselves when they, are not, when they don't recognize this. They think that now you are now, maybe my, my calling is to come and set. The way church is, I don't like it. You know, this, you know the church has been like this for years. The church has to begin to adapt to the global challenges of our time, you know. Because things are changing, you know, things are changing. We have to, the way we are doing it, if you continue doing it like that, we will not be relevant. No, there's something we are, we are not called to be relevant to the world. There's something we are called to do. We, we are called to do something. Can I tell you what is the work of the ministry? Can I tell you what is the work of the ministry? That the saints are supposed to be equipped. To equip the saints is to give them sight. And you give them sight by preaching and teaching. To equip the saints is to give them sight. The greatest equipment you can give to a saint is sight. Amen. Nothing else. If you heal his body and he's blind to the things of God, if you, if you heal his body and he's blind, meaning his eye of understanding is not enlightened, you've not helped him. You know why he called him? Partakers of the heavenly calling. How will you partake of what you don't see? How will you partake of what you don't see? So the call is to give, equip them and the equipment for the saints is give the saints sight. If they give the saints money, You've not helped the saints. And if it, was, if it was a problem of money, God would have made all of us. Maybe you gave, you gave your life to Christ, you become a millionaire. How many of us would like that? I'm sure evangelism would have been very easy. Huh? Immediately you give your life to Christ. I used to remember a, brother, a, friend, a friend of mine. Maybe he's here today, I don't know. But I've not seen him. When he gave his life to Christ, you know, he just came into, I've told the story several times. When he gave his life to Christ, he was into business. And then, you know, with the preaching, those days we have pre days of prosperity, so much of uh, uh, prosperity message, you know. And then, because it was prosperity taught in the milk, that's faith, you know, believing God for your deeds, believing God for your need to be met, and then he gave his life to Christ and then started trusting God for his business and his business prospered. His business prospered. He prayed and God answered his prayer. One of the days he met me. I said, oh boy, I didn't know things can work like this. Oh. I said, why, why, why did I give my life to Christ all this while? I've been wasting my time. But my, my, my business is prospering. It means that very soon I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a big guy. Me, I was amazed. You know, you know there are some things when you hear some testimony, you begin to ask yourself, Abby, did I get it wrong? Because this one seemed to have more testimony than me. Now, it wasn't that. For me, I had given my life to Christ for a long time and I was growing. The Lord was demanding growth from me and he just given his life to Christ and he answering his prayers, you know, profusely. So that his heart can. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And then he, he just said, No, no, no. In fact, that right now he, he has seen the secrets of making it. I didn't know why he didn't give his life to Christ all this while. 
that now he has seen the secret that he's going to become a very big boy in business. I was in, I was just getting into wilderness by then. So I just said, okay, just enjoy the Lord while he's near. Because they are going to come one time, they are going to make some demands from you. Hallelujah. Amen. Like I said, if it is issue of money, the Lord would have every one of us that gives his life to Christ, he would have made us a millionaire. You know, you just begin to, money will just begin to spin. But the weeping of the saints is what money cannot buy. Equipping of the saints is what silver and gold cannot buy. Equipping of the saints is the opening of the eyes of their understanding. Any saints, any child of God, you give anything and you don't open his eyes, you've robbed him. 